Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, in today's episode, we're talking about the trials and tribulations of long-term relationships. Let's go. Welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle, with over a million downloads and counting. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified life coach and midlife mentor. And once again, I am so glad to be here with you. Now, you're going to love this interview today. Surprisingly, we haven't talked about it much at all, this long-term relationship thing and what's really going on, the ups and the downs, the trials and tribulations of long-term relationships at our age. Seriously, if you're a typical listener and you're in a long-term relationship, you likely have been together with your partner or spouse now for more than 20 years, maybe even 30, maybe more. (laughs) That is something. I myself have been married almost 29 years. Fun fact, my husband and I met the old-fashioned way through a personal ad where you had to write a letter to a P.O. box at a newspaper. No swiping back then, no apps, no smartphones, nothing like that. (laughs) Most of you also know people who have been married a long time and also people who have not. And like I said, it's really something like when I, I do have a couple of friends who were high school sweethearts and they're still married. That that's, I don't know how else to say it. It's really something. Now I looked up a couple of stats and I got as current as I could from March, 2023. And this one says the average length of a marriage in the United States. And it's 19.9 years. That really surprised me. So it also says that while the national average marriage length is just under 20 years, couples in two states, Maine and West Virginia, typically have the longest lasting unions. (laughs) And a typical marriage in those two states lasts for 22.3 years. So that was pretty interesting. Then the other stat I wanted to share is this one. It's about baby boomer divorce rates. Now, baby boomer divorce rates have risen dramatically over the last 30 years. I don't know if you've heard of gray divorce. I actually did, now that I'm thinking about it, I did a podcast on gray divorce years ago, so I'll link that in the show notes. But a so-called gray divorce, that's like a later in life divorce, with adults 50 plus, um, that national divorce rate has roughly doubled since 1990. So for those age 65 plus, it's actually tripled from two in 1,000 married persons. (laughs) That's funny how you read a stat. Two in 1,000 married persons to six in 1,000. So this indicates people over 50 are more likely to get divorced now than ever before. That's why I wanted to shine the light on this other side of long-term relationships. So I think it's pretty interesting stuff, and I thought it was time to bring in an expert. Also, just quick, I want to make sure you know about a free gift that I have for you called Top 10 Questions to Reimagine Your Life After 50. So ask yourself, Is your life feeling a little blah lately? (laughs) Do you know you're meant for more, but don't know how to get there? Maybe you're starting to get concerned about your own lack of work-life balance. These 10 questions in the guide help you get clear so you can start to reimagine your life after 50. It's a great little guide. You can grab one at www.susierosenstein.com forward slash 10 questions. Okay, my friend, let me introduce you now to my amazing guest on the podcast. Her name is Dr. Liz Jenkins. She comes to us with over 30 years as a licensed marriage and family therapist. She got her PhD in psychology from Alliant U.S. International University in San Diego. She has extensive experience and expertise in working with individuals and couples on a wide range of issues and offers marriage counseling, couples therapy, marriage success coaching, affair prevention and recovery, individual counseling, and more. Liz has also been the clinical director of psychiatric hospital specialty programs such as adult stress, women's issues, and children's issues. She's also been a college instructor in general and social psychology and victimology, as well as a corporate coach and trainer providing on-site and web-based training, workshops, and critical incident debriefings with management and employees around workplace wellness and manager development. Liz's goal as a therapist is to assist you in identifying, understanding, and resolving the issues or areas in your life that aren't working. Each of us is a unique individual, and it's her role to bring the information to you in a way that meets your own style and situations. She works to demonstrate hope in relationships and helps you see 
that things do not have to continue the way they are right now. She helps you find ways to help you change and develop better techniques for making good choices and developing life balance. Liz's passion is to help clients develop more fulfilling relationships with others and with themselves. I loved having an opportunity to talk to Liz about some of the specific ways that you can overcome some of those bumps in the road (laughs) of your long-term relationship in midlife. So I know you're going to get a lot from this interview. Liz comes to us with a ton of experience and education. So it's going to be great. Please enjoy. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Women in the Middle podcast. Oh, thank you, Susie. I'm so excited to be here and looking forward to our chat. Oh, me too. You know, I've been at this podcast thing for a while now, and it occurred to me that I don't think I've ever taken a deep dive with an expert about the trials and tribulations and myths, I would imagine, of the long-term relationship. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's a fun one. You know, I'm in there. I'm in that long-term relationship, married 35 years together, 37 years. So I'm definitely on that path. I'd love to share with you what I've personally gone through or we're going through and, and what my clients are. It's, it's, it's a beautiful path, but a lot of times it gets a bad rap. And, um, oh, perfect. Perfect. I definitely want to hear all of that. I'm also in a long term relationship. I met my husband back in 1993 through a personal ad. Awesome. That I had to write into the newspaper, like on a letter with cursive writing, <laughs> and it went to a P.O. box. <laughs> I love it. Was it the old days back then? <laughs> you know, I, I he still he kept the letter. It was funny because we were both looking to meet people. So I answered his ad. And coincidentally enough, I had placed an ad about the same time and he answered my ad. But I made a joke and he didn't really get it. So he didn't really get it. So he didn't, you know, yeah, like he didn't get the joke and other people did get the joke. And I I wrote the letter from my cat and my I made it that my cat wanted fun treats and that, you know, his mommy needed more entertainment in her life. So please send cat treats. And he didn't really get the joke. <laughs> I love that. That's a cute slant on it. But even though he didn't understand, he was still a trooper. He was there was interested to say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to reply back. Well, you know what? Now that we're talking about it, I don't think he did reply back. I think it was just me. It was just me. He didn't reply back. (laughs) It was so long ago (laughs) to clarify my story. I remember we laughed about it because I didn't. He goes, I didn't. I used a Yiddish word and Uh he didn't he didn't get it. So um, anyway. He didn't reply back, but we placed the ads at the same time. He saw my ad okay. and I remember now that we're talking about it, I would like to dig that out. Actually, I know he saved it. It's in, I know where it is. Um, I even drew a little cartoon because he asked for a picture and I thought, <laughs> oh, I'm drawing a caricature. I'm not sending this guy a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Woman of action, you've got a request and you're going to make it. Uh, Sure, I can give you one, but I, let me show you my art, my artist. Yeah, you're work. not going to send me cat treats. I'm not going to send you a proper photo. <laughs> I don't think that would fly in today's world of online dating. That's for sure. But it will be 29 years for us. That's and awesome. yeah, so both of us have been um, been together for a long time. And I hear it all the time with my clients too. Women who are stuck, one of the common areas to be stuck is in relationships. And one of the most significant relationships can be what I call inner circle relationships with children, parents, siblings, and of course, partners. Mm -hmm. So please take it away. Tell us what is going on with these long-term relationships. Okay. Well, and I love it. And it really are, you know, relationships really are the basis for success and our growth, like in business, as well as um, in our personal world, because when this isn't right, um, you know, it bleeds through with other things. And I, and you, you mentioned, you know, the, the circle relationships. And oftentimes what I find us long term relationships are like, it's worse actually like that sandwich generation. We are stuck between, we have luckily, um, aging elderly relatives, family members type of thing that we're having oversight on, or we feel that tug to. As well as we have children, even adult children, minor adult children, there's still that 
vibe and that energy that we want to stay connected, but we're like negotiating. And how does that look as we get into that, that midlife? Um, I remember back when the kids were young, I said, Hey, look, this is my first time parenting. I'm sorry. I'll try again. And I still use that, you know, disclaimer when I'm, you know, trying to stay involved with the, with our, um, adults. They're, they're adult daughters. They're wonderful. But the common themes that I see with long-term relationships is that there is this myth or this cultural myth that, um, you're lucky if you get to that point. And when you do get to that point, you're sort of worn out and weary and maybe lost that spark or that early dream. And the way to recapture that is in that long-term relationship and go find something shiny or new, right? And um, having been married, like I said, for 35 years, I'm really an advocate of like, actually, you can keep the relationship, even if it's in the point where it's kind of becoming dissatisfying or distant, we can really rapidly retransformation and reconnect you, you guys back together rapidly really rapidly yeah, yeah rapid yes rapid. that word really stood out as you're telling this story oh it is because your know, research shows that when a couple comes to me all right and or comes to anyone really when you can quickly break that cycle of dissatisfaction um depression distancing and build some optimism and some spark it's kind of like, like when we go, well, I want, you know, we go on a health thing and we're wanting to get out of that rut and we want to move for me, we want to move that weight needle down, not up. And so I'm looking for a quick, enthusiastic boost to keep me going to keeping the, the, the exercise up or the eating green or whatever it might be. The same thing holds for relationships. We need that uptick to feel optimistic, to be energized to move forward. And so um, I think that for couples that are finding themselves in this situation, and and some of the people are there, one partner is more interested in making a change, the other one is still resigned to where they're at. It it can start with one person. And so I just want to like put that out to all your listeners is that you can have rapid change and reconnect. So, you know, the other thing that's a big deal with long-term relationships is some of the big changes that go on that affect the amount of time that we spend together as Mm -hmm. well. So the two obvious ones are when one person in the couple is retired Uh and the other one is when the kids leave. And both of those situations are huge. So even though there's lots of other um, pressure on relationships, one of these issues alone, let alone two sometimes, can really mean that you're spending a lot of time together. And uh, sometimes that's good. And sometimes it's challenging. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, that just reminds me of there was a client, she was a home home person. And so she managed the house and her kind of uh, executive hubby retired and he's wandering around and he's, you know, got his hands behind his back, kind of walking around. She says, you see him in the kitchen. Now he's pulling stuff out. Next thing she knows, he, she, he's trying to reorganize her kitchen. And she finally had to just like, stop, stop. You need a job. You need a fo- different focus. This is my territory. And so we were able to, you know, kind of talk about what that means. And it's, we have certain routines and, and we have certain territories that we might not even know. I mean, he's been coming and going in that house forever. But until he retired and he's looking for something to do, he was infringing into her territory. So we're, we're talking that when we have, let's talk about retirement and one person is, has made that leap. They're, um, needing to rethink themselves. Now we're talking about personal thing. Do I have a passion project? What am I planning to do to occupy my time? What are my expectations of my spouse who's still working? or still has other things that they want to be involved in, or, you know, side interests. And so we really have to start talking to each individual, what is their dream? What is their vision for retirement of themselves and their spouse? And yesterday, I was talking to a couple that he's been retired, and he's kept himself very happily occupied. Um, He has a little, does passion projects for friends, a little handyman type of stuff. And keeps himself busy around it. And he's quite content. 
He's a happy camper. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's a successful retiree from a busy career into, into a busy retirement, but he's, he's put effort into it and he's created balance. Um, and so he posed the question just last weekend with his wife and said, okay, when are you planning to retire? And for her, there was a little bit like, oh, pressure, you know, deer in the headlights. And she reluctantly and then kind of half-heartedly said, in a year. So she's got, she's got the time stamp out there. And so we started talking about what that's going to look like. And she says, I'm actually already having sweaty pawns and anxious about who am I? What am I? So right. we talked, you know, one of my um, successful retired uh, clients created a visual um, a tracking system. They took these jars. They were, they had five years, but for her, she's going to do one year. And she put these beautiful 12 stones in there for each year, one for each month rather. And then each month she would move it to another jar. So she started tracking and staying more intense, intentional and not letting it, it sneak up on her. Right now, their homework is they're doing some, what are the bucket list things? What would she like to do actively with her brain and her expertise to not feel like she's just going to sit at home? Because we know when you retire or if you retire and you do nothing but sit in your house, you lose your friendship, you lose your support, you lose your sense of identity, and we don't age as well. Yeah, Um, for sure. And the other thing is that retirement doesn't have to look one way. Like It's not like the sitcom situation that we grew up with, where we all kind of had the same idea of what a 50-year-old woman looked like, what a 60-year-old woman looked like, what retirement looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's not that way at all anymore, necessarily. Uh, But I do what I hear, and I'm sure you hear it too, though, is that women tend to be better equipped um, to entertain themselves and they have a long-term established social relationships. Now, in midlife, sometimes the friendship mm-hmm. thing really goes through a big change as well. But we're used to hobbies. We're used to um, having friends and socializing with friends and prioritizing friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're used to traveling with girlfriends. And it's not that men don't do this, right. but I've seen many times where if I had an extra time, I would know exactly. I have so many things to do, <laughs> but men don't have that many things to do. Typically, it's a broad sweeping generalization. But the other thing that I've heard come up, and then I absolutely want to hear your take on all this. Sometimes the partner, and in this case, um, the examples I have are are mostly with men, mm-hmm. is that they're older than Mm-hmm. their spouse. It was more traditional back in the day to mm-hmm. marry older women. I mean, marry an older man. Sorry about that. Yeah. And um, that tends to get a bit emphasized with retirement and with what's on people's agenda. And one s- specific thing that has come up in my community lately is travel, where one person wants to travel and the other person is still working. They just don't have that same kind of time uh, yes. and flexibility. Oh, so yeah, what are you seeing okay, with some absolutely. of these hiccups? Okay, and absolutely, and it's interesting you talked about the the age gap. Yeah, uh, there was some research that, that came out like what's the most ideal age gap, Ooh. and it was like a yes, three to four year age gap with the woman being three to four years younger because of that same thing. As we're going through different life stages, um, we're closely tied with that with our spouse or partner. And it's a great um, reminder for those of us that you know, we're, we're like five years apart. And so my husband has aged into an active retirement um, earlier than me. And yes, you bring up travel and all those types of things. Uh, fortunately, we've thought about this and we've been talking about the transition. I think that's one of the biggest things that couples don't necessarily do. It sneaks up on us. Right. Um, and we don't talk about it or dream forward. Connected couples, when we were, we think back to the early days, we had a lot of curiosity about each other. We were open to exploring things. We dreamed forward. What would this look like? Let's go here. Wonder what the kids, you know, we, there was a lot of energy and time and being pulled in different directions, as well as familiarity with each other. You're like, Oh, I know, you know, Liz can go to the restroom and come back and. 
her husband has gotten her, uh, you know, unsweet iced tea with lemon. It's there. Boom. It's just so, <laughs> that's so funny. When you use the word curiosity, I mm-hmm. paused and started to smile here in my Zoom square because, yeah, we are so not as curious as we used to be. Yes, absolutely. And so connecting couples and reconnecting, and it's okay. You can, I can guarantee you that we have been connected, disconnected, need to reconnect, kind of. That's part of the life cycle. That's part of the ups and downs and seasons in a relationship, marriage or otherwise. And so getting that curiosity back and starting to think about what it is, what does this look like? What do we want to do? Can we think outside the box? And so I've been fortunate. I do all of my work, all my, you know, remote. All of my clients, I, we can travel. I can be in different places. They can be in different places. It's very convenient and it's focused, but it allows me that flexibility that, um, because I'm younger and because heck, I, he wouldn't manage too long if he was the only one that I could talk to. I like to talk. <laughs> I like to visit with people. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I get to do what I'm passionate about. And I also get to be with the man that I'm passionate about. And so I think successful couples, or even if you're finding yourself, okay, we're at midlife or post midlife and let's get back. Let's get back to the early days. Right. Let's get that curiosity. Let's stop assuming you already know what their answer is going to be. Okay? <laughs> That's really it. <laughs> okay. All right. um, so we, sometimes we build our own, our own boxes and our own confines. So uh, anyone that's approaching midlife or is getting it is in midlife, my one of the recommendations is stop a moment, think back to the early days. What were the fun things that brought you together? What were the activities, the interests? Um, what, remember that curiosity and that spark and how can you take it now and replicate some of that? Let's get you out of your rut and into that newness. Um, and yes, long-term successful relationships can be finding new facets because we are ever evolving. You know, we're excited about things in life. Research also shows that if you're feeling down and dumped, you feel a little disconnected from your relationship, you got to do something novel, got to put some spark in it. So retirement doesn't mean rinse and repeat like you talked about. Let's just sit on our front porch and watch the neighbors and, you know, <laughs> hear the, you know, type of thing and reminisce about the past. We got to create future. That's going to get us energy. That's going to get our novelty. And um, the research was based on some lame obstacle course and they brought couples in and they rated their, their relationship and they put them on an obstacle course and came back and had them rate using the same scoring rate their relationship. A hundred percent of those people rated more fun, more excitement, and more, um, I'm going to say, passion about their relationship. Oh, Liz, that is, is that is so great. I love that it was, it was just an obstacle course and had such yeah. a big result. Yeah. But, you know, it's really the same thing about being stuck in any part of your life. So many of us describe the stuckness as uh, yeah. feeling stagnant. And if you really think about what does stagnant mean, it means no change, mm. no change, no challenge, nothing new. Yes. And even though newness is unknown and can be scary sometimes, you're right that you have different responses to things. You have different reactions, different experiences, different interpretations to shake things up. Mm-hmm. And it's so important. I always say if you, if, if you don't change anything, nothing will change. Like yes. something you're has very, to change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's funny that you mentioned that because last year, my husband's an avid surfer. He's surfed for years. We have seven, eight boards and we're in, we're in Texas right now. So he's <laughs> landlocked, <laughs> but we're from Southern California. I have never surfed. I was always on the beach, but last year we went to Costa Rica and I learned to surf. 61 years old. I learned to surf, stood up, not graceful, but I had such a great time. I connected with him. He was so impressed. I mean, we had a great time and we're going back again. All right. So it is, you get unstuck and it can be something as simple as a, you know, taking a different route home. If you're foodies and you're at a place, start picking a list of random places that you'd like to visit for, for lunch. You know, you got on a budget, lunch, appetizers, whatever, um, and hit them up. That newness and that novelty 
it just a little bit turns up the dial for you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We did something like that. And now that I'm, now that you're mentioning it, it really was fun. So sometimes we pick a, a, a type of food and I live in a big city where food is great. Mm-hmm. Um, so one time it was like, let's find, let's explore hamburgers. <laughs> and okay. so we went to it. all these different hamburger places. We were able to compare them. You know, one time we did it with the, with the ramen noodles. We did that once, right? Cause there's okay. so, so many places. And, uh, what was another one? Oh, one time they did one I wasn't that into, but it turned out to be fun. They wanted to compare fried chicken. I, I have, I have, there's a lot of men in this family. They do enjoy barbecue. So, um, anyway, and I, I posed a question recently. I'm like, why don't we explore vegetarian places? <laughs> and I, I'm not a vegetarian, but I love vegetarian food. And I just wanted mm-hmm. to see the reaction because my husband's always posting the 10 best restaurants for this, the 10 best restaurants yeah. for that. And then it was yeah. crickets. And I thought, I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> and then a few more minutes went by and he found one. 10 oh, best vegetarian there we go. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right. Even it. about eating out, you go to the same places. Uh-huh. And there is some comfort in that. And there's some neighborhood feel to that. You know, when the pandemic started, I uh, saw one of my friends, well, we were into the pandemic. One of my friends was posting about coffee joints and she uh, had, her kids were home mm-hmm. and they challenged themselves to try a new coffee place during the pandemic where you couldn't go anywhere except drive. Okay. Right. To drive uh-huh. throughs around the whole city with her daughter. So it was a relationship with her daughter, but still it was so fun and so new. And she went to independent coffee places all around the city. And I ended up interviewing her because I thought, oh my gosh, that is such a cool idea. And it it was so good in so many ways. So I love that you're mentioning the things that may already be part of your life to do something I call amplify. So you're amplifying, you're looking at this, thing that's already in your life and you're making it better on purpose. You're bringing in newness. You're being curious about it. You're challenging what else could be as a Mm -hmm. result of something you already like. Because I know uh, I've heard many conversations in my community about this where it's like we have to find something new Mm -hmm. to do. And it's kind of overwhelming if it's not related to anything you've already done. Like, What do I want to do? What do I want to do? I don't know what I want to do. Yeah, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what my passion project is. I don't I don't know a hobby that I like and my husband likes. Like, ooh, I don't know. It sounds crazy. (laughs) (laughs) So I like just sometimes looking at what you already do, like eat out (laughs) and and have more fun with it. Right, right. And so it's and like this, your um, client and person you interviewed, I mean, that was brilliant. The simplest things can be sometimes the most brilliant ones. We don't, when you, you say, what's your passion project? I don't know. Okay, right. well, you know, um, let's drop the overwhelm and step into something that you're comfortable with. Maybe, you know, it's for maybe some people, they want to take different hikes or they, I have um, some folks that want to, sample um different types of movies so now they're going back they used to say they, they were movie buffs so they're going back and they're going back and then we're going to sample all the 1935 movies that i don't say netflix has on wow. and so, so they do the things so you can recreate and come together on all sorts of, of things um the other thing is you said there's there's um clues within your relationship and within your everyday stuff and if your spouse your partner is doing something, there may be ways that you can join them in their world, or they can teach you um, about a a new love. Like for me, surfing, I always was the observer on the beach, you know, right? With a good tan, tan, I'm telling you. (laughs) You (laughs) So so I think it's it's important for couples just to realize that wherever you are, you can start, you can, um, and you can do it very quickly, it can add fun, we know that novelty and fun and action helps us start to feel better. To feel uncomfortable or overwhelmed with, you know, the task, that's normal. Because by nature, we are designed to stay safe, right? Absolutely. And so, yeah. But we don't know 
how much fun it might be on the other side. Um, if, and I would, I guess one of the things when working with couples is that if your partner, let's say I'm me and I want to, I want to travel. I want to, let's, let's hit the road. I want to do the RV. We want to do, you know, six months here and things like that. Um, I may be a hundred percent on board, but my pressuring and pushing my partner or my hubby into something that he's not ready or he hasn't had time to see it and accept it um, will create a big divide. And then people incorrectly assume, well, see, we have nothing in common. I, we just were one of those statistics, Liz. Like, no, wow. you don't have those statistics. we can back it up and we can, you know, help the other person start to see our dream. We can take it in snippets. Maybe if I do want to do this big RV thing, maybe what we start off with is, is we get an RV for a weekend, right? And we get a small RV, not the mega RVs, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that plop out and go everywhere type of thing. But to, uh, and we go someplace local. So it's an easy drive. It's something novel. It's something new. We, you know, we park it. We see what it feels like to be in an RV park. You, you want it, you can take a portion of that dream and start to, add it in and test drive it for the relationship. Maybe after a couple of times that I decide, oh, I did not know how tiny those bathrooms were going to be. So now that, you know, when we, and, and, it, and oh, I didn't know what it was going to be like to have to park it at night with uh-huh. all these people watching me. Oh, <laughs> That's yes, what happened to yes. us. Okay. <laughs> the, yes, the backing up part. You the, know? Oh, <laughs> they stand around. Right. There's a crowd of yes. people watching you back and this thing up. And going, mm, first so time. funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, you know, you want whatever your dream is, before you make it permanent, it's probably good to start test driving it. And inviting your partner, inviting your spouse into that dream um, and seeing what it is and not being afraid or just getting creative on how do you twist it or, or you arrange it. Maybe you want to keep the family house because you want to be close to kids and possible grandkids or whatever, or you like your neighbors, but you're willing to travel some. So then we want to start talking about what I call my couple's dictionary. What does travel some mean to you? And um, most people have different definitions around the words. So um, when I say, I want to stay, I want to keep the family home because I want to feel, I want to be secure. I want to be close to the kids. What does that mean? It might mean that I'm still feeling the pull and the tug about being a parent and a mom. It may mean that I'm feeling like letting my kids down or I'm being a bad grandmother if for grandmother yeah. critters or kids. That's where another aspect of the curiosity is before we jump in and assume that Liz is just stuffy and she doesn't stagnant and she doesn't want to go any place and it's time she just let her adult daughters just grow up. We want to see what's underneath that. Um, and when I want to travel some, what does that look like? I need to describe it. My husband needs to understand it. Yeah. Does it mean you want to be a snowbird or does it mean that two trips in the winter would be awesome if you don't like winter? Okay. I'm very biased right now because we're getting a big snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> so are you yes on snow or down on snow? I'm down on snow. Like it's okay. pretty, but really I could do without the winter. I could do without. <laughs> this is interesting because I'm. Um, that was a personal also question because we're looking at where will we relocate? Where are we going to go? Because we, we've lived in California and Colorado and, wow. Idaho and you know. Well, we and- started that discussion. Um, mm-hmm. I just, neither of us are anywhere near retiring, but, but I really don't like the winter. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I just, uh, you know, I just started to say, I really got to get out of here. I, mm-hmm. It's not good for me. And my job is portable now. Yeah. So, you know, what could it look like? Where's a place that you would tolerate visiting yeah. while I am working at an yes. offsite location for a little bit? And yes. yeah, like if I went away for four weeks and you came in the middle or if I went away for six weeks and you came in the middle, mm-hmm. like, is that something we could look at? Um, And where would you want to go? Mm-hmm. Right. Because right. I have more interests, uh, but he's really about scuba diving. So he wants to be someplace where there's premier scuba diving. And for me, it's not all about scuba, but it's definitely about beach and water and whale watching. For me, it's all whale watching and being on boats and stuff. So that's easy enough to overlap, you know? Um, And I'm not, 
I'm not ready to do it yet, but I just wanted to start to have the conversations because I have noticed that I'm getting grouchier about the winters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it. Um, there's that seasonal affective disorder kind of like yeah. get, get housed down in the winter. But people that are in desert areas, you know, when we're in California, you get it in the summer because it's so hot, you don't go right. out. So, you know, yeah, where where do I want the, the extremes? I'm a big advocate because we've moved, we've moved for fun. It's been personal um, drive the family. We go and interview a state. Ooh, and fun. So, yeah. Interviewing doesn't sound so permanent, right? Like we were looking for a new job or career, like, oh, well, I've got a job interview. There, we don't have to have that panic, like, oh, what if they say yes? Because you can say no. So interviewing a state, interviewing a beach, but we're going to go wherever it might be, say the Bahamas, and we're going to go interview that for three weeks. We've got this real cool kind of thing. And I don't know if there's whales in Bahamas, but there's certainly scuba diving for your hubby. Right? Yeah, there's uh, there's amazing things there. That's for okay. sure. You know, <laughs> it's just so fun. funny because uh, I'm the only one in my family who can't stand the winter. They, they They're fascinated. They're like, but it's so pretty, but there's so many things to do. You know, and I'm like, I tried the skiing. I don't, I'm not a fan. You know, I just, I just don't enjoy, but, um, yeah, it's really important to know what you want. And then also, is that an area that you can connect more if you're open and more curious? I really hear what you're saying. And you're right about the myths because there are definitely a lot of messages out there that, Mm -hmm. that midlife after the kids are gone. And after retirement, that that might be it. <laughs> like, right. Oh, yeah. And talk about, okay, well, shut down the bedroom because you don't need that anymore. And like, that's absolutely wrong. Incorrect. You know, that is a myth that, no, actually, this gets you time to reconnect, have time. Int- intimacy will look different um, because, gosh, our bodies look different. Our bodies function differently. But it may actually be better um, if you just ignore the negative things people say and just get creative and get honest and get vulnerable and just have fun. Well, it's such a positive message too. Even I'm still remembering when you said rapidly at the beginning, that surprised me that even distanced and disconnected relationships can be quickly and successfully reconnected. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. It's, you know, when I work with couples, we do a real quick, um, well, the, it's a couple's smart restart sprint program. And I use the word sprint because I want to inject enthusiasm and optimism. Um, and it's valid. It's not woo stuff. It's, it's a hundred percent doable and, and possible because I see it every single day with my couples. Right. Um, but we get, you know, I get a foundations first assessment. And so I get a real objective research based idea of their strengths of the obstacles or areas of, of conflict. I get to see how they, they show up. I do interviews with each of them independently because I need to know the inside scoop. I need to know what's going on in their head. They don't need to play nice. And then we, <laughs> and then we come together, you know, in the couples and I bring that together and then we design a roadmap that's just for them. Um, you know, because it, these, these couples are couples. We have a very unique relationship dance and interaction yeah. and it's so, so it's yeah so that's blend um and then i have other support system where they get to t- be with me with whatsapp outside so i can literally coach them through you know we had a flop we had a fail we're confused i i talk to them outside of our sessions and and things and so um well i also see here that you have a freebie that's really great what is yeah. this free couples connection checklist okay. that is um it's getting you back together again. Life has been pulling you apart, myths, whatever, pressures have been pulling you apart. And so successful couples stay connected. And so I want you to kind of get creative. And so there's three things you do every day. And I also want to keep it simple and, and attainable. Three things you do every day um, for them. Three things you do on a weekly basis and three things you guys do on a monthly basis. And it means coming together and so you're reconnecting, you're seeing each other in new ways. Um, you are showing up better instead of like, okay, yeah, he's there. I'll just, you know, we're, we're putting the manners back into it. We're putting oh, I love that. That's so good. Type of, type of thing. That's so, so good. So I'm, I'm going to include the link to this in the show notes okay. because it's kind of a long link, but head over to uh, my website and get the show notes and also for people who want to get a hold of you, what is the best way? 
Um, my website, drlizjenkins.com. I'm on Facebook. So it's Dr. Liz Jenkins. Just check me out there. Perfect. And, and Instagram, if you want to see me with some some more videos. <laughs> Amazing. I'll okay. put all those, all that information thank in the you. show notes. Liz, thank you so much. What a delight it was to talk to you and to think about some of that stuff in my own relationship, that person lad and how I forgot a key part of it, it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is so, such a wonderful um, memory and such a really cool way that you guys came together and look at you here. 29 hey, here we are. Here yeah. we are. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. It's um, it, I really related to a lot of what you said, and I can't wait for um people to get a hold of that free couples checklist. I think it'll be awesome. Yeah. So thank you so much no for problem. everything today. Take care. Okay, that's it for this episode. So much great info. I really loved when Liz shared the research about the power of doing something novel and how novelty, fun, and action can really make a difference. It really makes so much sense because at this age, so many of us appreciate routine. And when it comes to relationships, those routines aren't always helpful or inspiring. (laughs) I think you know what I mean. And when you add in how much fun our phones are, it can really emphasize the absence of a fun connection with your partner. As Liz mentioned, novelty helps curiosity. And that's a really good thing when it comes to reconnecting. So lots for you to think about. Now, as you know, this podcast is all about how to love your life again after 50. It's really all about coaching you to become more intentional and to incorporate mindfulness into your life as a regular practice. And mindfulness is the key ingredient to regret-proofing your life. This is how you put yourself on your agenda. My focus as your midlife coach is to help you get unstuck, clear, and excited about your life again. Being stuck can be rough, total drag, but it doesn't have to mean you're completely immobilized. (laughs) It could just mean that you're not where you want to be in your life in general or your business. And maybe it's even the intersection of the two. Another common reason you might feel off these days is that you're too darn busy and have no work-life balance. So the bottom line is that you know you're meant for more and you don't want to waste valuable time. So if you're ready to make some important changes and want to be way more clear about what you want and how to get there, I can help you create the success you're craving. That's why I created the Women in the Middle Academy with you in mind, because it's a warm, supportive, and fun coaching community of like-minded women. You can feel great about your future. You really can. So email me your questions and let's start talking about it and see if it's for you. Go ahead and book your free, no obligation momentum call at www.womeninthemiddleacademy.com. For show notes and links, head over to www.susierosenstein.com and click the podcast tab and look for episode 304. And if you're interested in applying to be a guest on my new upcoming podcast, Women in the Middle Entrepreneurs, head over to www.midlifeinterviews.com and apply. Thanks so much for listening. It's time for you to put yourself first one thought at a time. I'm Susie Rosenstein, and I'll talk to you again next week.